This program contains graphic images and discussion of medical procedures. Viewer discretion is advised. Dr. Shellhorn and I are both cornea specialists at the University of California, San Francisco Department of Ophthalmology. And there's nothing more that we enjoy uh, than talking about the cornea. So we're thrilled to bring some clarity to the cornea in a discussion for everyone who's joining us this evening. Uh, we have some financial disclosures. And the lay of the land this evening, what we'd like to do is a brief introduction of what is the cornea and why is it so beautiful? Why is it so important? And then I'll take part one, which is all about dry eyes. So we'll really dig into what does dry eye mean? How do you develop dry eye? How can you treat dry eye? And then I will turn the baton over to my bright and talented colleague, Dr. Julie Shellhorn. She will also dig into what is the cornea in a little more depth, bringing you a little more clarity. And then she'll go off into different surgeries of the cornea. We'll take a break and we will then answer all the questions you have about the content that you've been presented. So thank you again for joining us. Let's get right into it. What is the cornea? Well, briefly, the cornea is the clear covering on the front of the eye. And in fairness, except for us who think about the cornea all day long, most people don't think about the cornea. And the reason why is because it's completely transparent. So if you look at someone and say, my, you have beautiful eyes, what you really mean is, my, what a spectacularly transparent front of the eye you have that allows me to look through the cornea and see the iris, which is the colored part of the eye. So, I'll remind you the basics of how the eye works. What happens is that light comes from the outside world and it comes to the cornea. And the cornea refracts light into the eye, it focuses light. And the light goes through the front part of the eye, goes through the pupil, which is the hole in the iris, and then gets further focused by the lens of the eye. And the lens is what's get, what gets cloudy with a cataract. The light then travels through the rest of the eye, bounces off the back of the eye called the retina and sends signals to the optic nerve. The optic nerve travels signals all the way to the back of the eye and that registers an image. So the first thing that happens is that light has to pass through the cornea. So similar to if you spent a ton of money on a really expensive car with an amazing engine, but the windshield was filthy, your car wouldn't function well. Similar is the cornea. If the cornea is not perfectly clear, the whole eye cannot function. Your vision is dysfunctional. And there are so many reasons you can have an abnormal cornea. And Dr. Shellhorn will take the baton on this later and go into it in a bit more detail. But one way your cornea could be abnormal is just the shape. Now, there's a regular irregular shape and a really irregular shape. And if your cornea is just a little bit of a funny shape, we call that astigmatism. And many people are familiar with that term because it means that you are need to wear uh, glasses to correct how uh, the light is focused in the back of your eye. So this is a picture of somebody with a markedly abnormal shape. And this is a genetic disease called keratoconus. So the light comes through and gets scattered and is very blurry. Similarly, if you have a terrible infection in the front of your eye on, on the cornea, of which we see a lot of at UCSF, you can imagine how somebody would not only be in pain, but couldn't see because their cornea was infected. There are many reasons that your body health, your systemic health can affect your eyes and your cornea. This is an example of calcium that's deposited on the front of the eye because of many reasons. There are certain body diseases where calcium can uh, deposit on the cornea. There are also eye diseases where calcium can deposit on the cornea. And then this funny picture is a very swollen cornea. So if the windshield was really thick and there are many acquired reasons. So for example, after surgical complications, but there are also genetic reasons why you can have a swollen cornea. You know, 
Dr. Shelford and I love being ophthalmologists for many, many reasons. And one of them is that we really can match what's happening on your eyes and in, in your body. And the tr it it's, remains true about the health of the cornea. And as a matter of fact, we can learn a lot about your systemic health by just looking at the front part of your eye, by just looking at the cornea. And this is just a quick screenshot from one of our textbooks that sort of just illustrates all, not even all, many of the systemic diseases that we can diagnose by just looking at the cornea. Um, so that's one of the many reasons that we love what we do and one of the many reasons that we love being cornea specialists because our job is to really help your body maintain the clarity that's required for clear vision. So with that, we move on to topic one. When, as a physician, I'm asked to give a topic to a general audience, I often think, ooh, I hope they don't pick something too dry. I don't want everyone to fall asleep. Well, this is the driest topic that we could possibly pick for you, and I'll try to make it as exciting as possible. Dry eye, in fact, is not that dry of a topic because similar to the health that similar to how your, the health of the eye can give us some reflection on the health of your body, the deep study into dry eye can tell us many things, sometimes just about your eyes, but also about the general state of health of your body. So if I were to ask you, what does dry mean to you? Everyone might come up with a different uh, idea. Maybe a dry martini sounds good right about now, or a dryer or some dry eyes. And where I'd like to start with this dry eye talk is just to sort of accept the general concept that this term dry eye means something completely different to everyone who uses it. So it means something different to a patient who has dry eye. It means something different to your primary care doctor. It means something different to your optometrist or your general ophthalmologist. And as a matter of fact, it means something very specific to a cornea specialist. Now, when you're suffering from dry eye, it is often the case that you are referred to a cornea specialist. Not if you have mild dry eye and you do well with basic treatments of which we'll discuss, but when the dry eye becomes severe, you often meet one of us. And the reason why is we call ourselves cornea specialists, but the truth is on our diplomas, it says that we are not only specialists in the cornea, but we all have a fellowship in cornea and external disease. And what external disease means is the ocular surface. So we have studied uh, the cornea as well as the ocular surface. And the ocular surface is the lining of the outside of the eye, which is the conjunctiva, the eyelids, the eyelashes, and of course the tear film. So this is how many cornea specialists uh, think about dry eye and study dry eye and take care of dry eye. And this is how we together are talking about why uh, the cornea is important and that leads right into a discussion of why dry eye is important. So in general, dry eye is a disorder of the tear film. And when we started talking about the function of the eye, we said when light comes in, it hits the cornea and goes through the eye. But in fact, that's not perfectly correct. What's perfectly correct is that the first thing that light hits when it hits the eyes is the tear film. And so in order to have crisp, clear vision, you need a perfect tear film. And tear film is more than just water. There are components to the tear film, and that's how we'll start. We'll talk about what's the recipe for healthy tears. And remember, the tears will sit over the cornea. So tears have a very basic recipe. And the recipe is you need a little part of mucus, and we often call that mucin, and you need a lot of water, which is aqueous, and a little bit of fat, which is lipid or oil. And the directions are you have to mix that well together and then blink about 22 times a minute, which is what we normally uh, do in our relaxed state. And when that occurs and you have a healthy cornea and a perfect tear film, your vision is great. If there is a disruption in your ability to produce any of these components, it ends up that you develop a dry eye syndrome. So the anatomy of where these components come from. So the white part of the eye is called the sclera, and there's a lining on the outside of the white part of the eye called the conjunctiva, and there's tiny little blood vessels on that lining. There are also cells called goblet cells, and those goblet cells make a product called mucin, and the mucin is in charge of helping the tears stick to the cornea. 
up above uh, the eyeball, underneath the eyebrow, kind of off to the side. So up in the lateral part of the orbit sits our lacrimal gland way up here. And the lacrimal gland is in charge of producing aqueous or the water component of our tears. And in our eyelids ourselves, in the eyelids themselves, the lower lid and the upper lid, are tons of glands, about 22, 24 glands all across horizontally, the upper and lower called meibomian glands. And these meibomian glands make the fat and the lipid. And so when we blink and when we live, all of these parts secrete their part of the recipe to make the tears. Now, I won't spend a ton of time talking about disorders of conjunctiva cells and goblet cells where you would have a mucin deficient dry eye. Although at UCSF, you can imagine we see just about everything. So we certainly see mucin deficient dry eyes. That tends to be more specific diseases, unusual diseases like Stevens Johnson syndrome or graft versus host or uh, very severe complications that you've had to an antibiotic or a drug or certain types of uh, reactions, uh, side effects of bone marrow transplants and sort of severe um, diseases. What the vast majority of people uh, have when they have a dry eye is either an aqueous deficiency or a lipid deficiency. So I'll tell you something interesting. When everybody says, I have dry eye, almost everyone thinks that they have an aqueous deficiency. And what aqueous deficiency means, you actually don't produce enough tears. Your lacrimal gland is not functioning well. It turns out in the United States, when you have dry eye, the vast majority of people have a lipid deficiency. So this means that you actually are producing the aqueous tears fine, but the lipid, whose job it is to stabilize the tear film on the eye, if you can imagine a really great Italian dressing, that oil will come up to the top and uh, the fatty tears also come up to the top and stabilize all of the aqueous of the tear film. And so you are making tears, they're just evaporating too quickly. So if you were to Google dry eye and try to get into the nitty gritty of it, you'll find that there's this Tear Film and Ocular Surface Disease Society, which is, uh, sounds like a great group to meet at a cocktail party. And they come with a complicated uh, diagram of which we love. Uh, and I will not go into this in detail or else our dry eye lecture really will turn dry. Uh, what I would like to do is bring your attention to the bottom, the blue and yellow here. And sort of the 43 word description of dry eye really ends in a picture saying that the vast majority in that yellow, the vast majority of people end up having an evaporative type of dry eye. There are some people with a true aqueous deficient dry eye, and we'll talk about that. And then there are a few people who sort of have a component of both that would be both aqueous and evaporative loss. So again, aqueous meaning you're not making enough water tears and evaporative dry eye, meaning that the lipid component of your tear film is dysfunctional and you're making enough water. It's just that your tears are evaporating too quickly. Let's dig in to what it means to have aqueous deficient dry eye. Again, with aqueous deficient dry eye, your lacrimal gland is not producing a lot of aqueous tears. When you have aqueous deficient dry eye, that type of person will have the following symptoms. My eyes feel dry. Feels like there's something in my eye. My eyes are burning. Many times throughout the day, my vision just doesn't seem to be clear. I almost have to blink myself into good vision. My eyes are red and irritated. My eyes just feel tired. Then when you come to see us, if you've had your eyes examined, you put your chin in the chin rest and your forehead comes forward and a big microscope called a slit lamp is put in front of you. And here I am examining maybe you. And what we see with aqueous deficient dry eye is that you don't produce tears. One way we measure that are with tiny baby rulers called Schirmer strips. We have you close your eye and the, the strip is filter paper and it actually gathers the amount of tears and we measure what your production is over a five minute period of time. In addition, we can put in different eye drops that stain your tear film. So we can measure what we call the tear meniscus. We know how many tears, how high the, the layer should be that layers over the bottom eyelid. Additionally, we can tell if there's damage to your cornea. So if you don't make enough water your cornea can desiccate, which means dry out, which means you can get teeny tiny little scratches on your cornea. We take that reasonably seriously because just like if you have a scratch anywhere else on your body, the concern is that it would get infected if the skin is left open. And if there are 
If there's constant epithelial or skin breakdown in the cornea, your vision isn't good, you are often very uncomfortable, and it's a risk for a corneal infection. And as you remember from the earlier picture, sometimes corneal infections can become terrible and visually significant. So when you have no water and your cornea is very rough, we take that uh, quite a bit uh, more seriously. And we'll talk about some systemic diseases or body diseases that can be associated with an aqueous deficient dry eye. One of the diseases that can be associated with an aqueous deficient dry eye is something called Sjogren's disease. This is an autoimmune disease where the body's immune system is hyperactive and attacks things as foreign, which are actually self. So with Sjogren's disease, the immune system attacks the lacrimal gland, often attacks the salivary glands as well. And oftentimes this can be associated with different autoimmune diseases, different arthritis conditions, rheumatoid arthritis, for example. So if you have a severe dry mouth and have dry eyes during your examination, that's something you should bring up. Someone with a severe dry mouth, someone with a lot of cavities. As a cornea specialist, we would like to know that uh, information. Sjogren's disease has other systemic implications, and there are ways that we can test for that. So if you have a severe dry mouth, bring that up and uh, your corneal specialist will know how to further evaluate you. With age, and there's just no nice way to say it, so I just say with maturity, we produce less aqueous from our tear film. Oftentimes it's postmenopausal. There are many hormonal changes where our aqueous production goes down, but to be fair in men as well, as you get older, you produce uh, less aqueous. Also, as we get older, we take more medications and many medications such as antihistamines, antidepressants, anti-anxiety medicines can decrease the aqueous production and at least contribute to some dry eye. And then there are many more severe diseases where the lacrimal gland and, uh, can be obliterated and uh, severely damaged. So complications of bone marrow transplants called graft versus host, complications of radiation in and around your face and eyes can develop a very severe dry eye. When you are treating an aqueous deficient dry eye, you are acting like a plumber. You are saying, I need more water in this bucket and the bucket would be the eye. So the way you get more water is to either turn on the faucet and give yourself more water or to plug all of the outlet holes to allow the water that is there to stay there longer. And in terms of aqueous deficient dry eye, turning on the hose and adding more water means an eye drop. We have to add more water to the surface of the eye, so we need to use eye drops. And plugging the holes, if you look along the flat part of the eyelid where the eyelashes are, and right in the corner is a teeny tiny little drainage hole called a punctum. There's one in the lower lid and the eyelid, and it's a hole that goes to a little tube that connects into your nose. This is why your nose runs when you cry, because the tears go into that little hole and drain into your nose. Well, it turns out in severe aqueous deficient dry eye, we want to plug that hole. So there are many different ways to do that with little silicone plugs or other plugs, and sometimes in severe cases, we just surgically destroy the hole, sometimes with heat called punctal cautery. And what that does, it's just like when you have a bathtub with two drains, if you were to plug up the drains, the water that is there stays around longer. So typically, the next question is often, well, which eye drop should I use? It's a bit like saying to someone off the street, what, what sort of shoes should I wear, right? It sort of depends on the context. Are you going jogging? Are you going to work? Are you going to a fancy party? In general, for aqueous deficient dry eye, we do not recommend the get the red out drops. Really for any condition, we don't recommend the get the red out drops. If you're getting married tomorrow and you have photos, possibly we'll recommend it for the photos. In absence of that, the get the red out drops have ingredients, active ingredients, either tetrahydrazoline or nafzoline. And what they do is they vasoconstrict. And we don't like this for long-term use. Why? Because when you use them, it constricts the blood vessels. It constricts the muscle on the blood vessels to make the blood vessels skinny so you don't see as much of them. And when the drop wears off, the blood vessels dilate. And then you use the drop again and it constricts, that wears off and it dilates. And just like any muscle, if you constrict and relax and constrict, the muscle gets big. And so what happens with chronic use is that you get something called reflex vasodilation. So with chronic use, you actually get a much redder eye, which is fantastic if you own stock and I get the red out drop, but it's terrible if your eyes are red and irritated. For mild dry eye, you can actually use any brand you'd like. You can use generic brand, brand name. There's many different on the market. 
If you're using tears about one to four times a day because your eyes feel a little bit dry and you put on tears and feel better, that's fantastic. And you should just find the brand that, is, that you can afford and feels best on your eyes. And just like shoes, you have to try a couple different brands. Just because some people like one brand doesn't mean that you will. You just have to try a couple and you'll find one that feels soothing when you put it on. Now in true aqueous deficient dry eye or more severe dry eye, you're using these, you're turning on the faucet, you have to put in artificial tears many more times a day. And in that instance, what we'd like you to do is use a preservative free artificial tear. And the reason is, is because when artificial tears are preserved, the common preservative is called benzalkonium chloride. That preservative, when used more than four times a day, becomes toxic to the surface of the eye. And it in fact sort of worsens your dry eye symptoms. And remember when we stain the cornea and we could see tiny little drops of aqueous deficiency where the cornea is damaged, when with prolonged use of preservatives, we can actually see damage to the cornea as well. So sometimes when your eye feels really dry and you're just pouring in too many preservative free drops, I sorry, drops with preservatives, it compounds the problem. And it's hard for us to tell which is dry eye and which is just preservative toxicity. And then be aware that when you're looking on the market for artificial tear options, there are drops, which are just more like water. There are gel that stays around longer. So the first few blinks are a little thicker. There's ointments that we often recommend at bedtime, but sometimes when it's severe during the day, ointments come in a tube. And as dry eye progresses, sometimes we're discussing options like autologous serum, and then when it's very severe, there are some specialty contact lenses that are rigid contact lenses that are vaulted over the cornea that can bathe the cornea in fluid all day long. A note about ocular surface inflammation. So if you have very dry eyes, they can be inflamed eyes. So inflamed eyes are often red. So sometimes we use anti-inflammatory drops to help with the discomfort of the dry eye. In addition to giving you more water on the surface of the eye, we actually have to decrease the inflammation. So mild steroid drops are excellent anti-inflammatory drops and most people who are really suffering feel great on a little mild steroid drop. There are many different types of steroid drops with various different types of potency. And the truth is, is you don't need a high potency uh, steroid for a dry eye disease. So for example, high potency steroids get inside of the eye and nothing about dry eye is inside of the eye. It's all on the surface of the eye. So we really only need very mild uh, potent dry uh, steroid drops when we're using them for the purpose of dry eyes. It's absolutely true that in some people, steroid drops can be associated with complications, and those complications could be increased risk of infection, an increased risk of your eye pressure going up, or an increased risk of cataract development. However, that is with the use of high potency steroids many times a day for months, and in general for dry eye, we're talking very rare use of low potency steroids. So in general, this ends up not being a risk, but I will say, Anyone on topical steroids can be used topical steroids for a very long time safely, as long as you are monitored carefully. And that's what we would ask for you is to just maintain your relationship with your ophthalmologist. We will check your eye pressure and make sure that those complications don't occur. And if they occur and we catch them early, we can just stop the drop and the pressure would come down. So preservative free steroid drops are also available. And then oftentimes is the question, how do we use Restasis and Sequa and Zydra, now those are uh, drops with non-steroid anti-inflammatory medicine. So Restasis and Sequa use a medication called cyclosporin in a very low concentration, and Zydra uses a novel medicine called Lefitigrass. I'll just tell you that many people feel strongly about these drops. There are, we have many patients who take, say, take them and say, it's the only thing that helped me. And I have just as many who say, I hate this drop. It's expensive, it stings. So we have people that say it helps and we have people that say they don't help. They really don't cause problems. So if you can afford it and want to try it, that's okay. They're very well marketed drops. And that when you have a situation where it helps some people and it doesn't help others, how in academic nerdy medicine do we sort that through? Well, we do something called a randomized control trial where we put some people on the drug and we put other people on placebo and we see how well does the drug really work. I'm just going to put out there and I will say it with the context uh, that many people feel strongly about these drops. 
But there is a group called the Cochrane Research Group that analyzes the research that's available for efficacy, efficacy of many different treatments. And it turns out, I think now two years ago, they evaluated all the randomized control trials that were associated with cyclosporin drops. So that's the restasis. And the end assessment is that the restasis is about, this is a tiny little conclusion, but just to tiny little font, but to remind me to tell you, when this group looked at 18 randomized control trials, their assessment is that the uh, restasis type drops work as well as an artificial tear. Now, a lot of people are not going to like that sentence because a lot of people believe that it works, but a lot of people don't believe that it works. So the data that we have right now would indicate that we need to look at this a little bit more. Um, but if you are taking it and don't believe it works, you shouldn't feel emotionally obligated to continue it because research would show that perhaps an artificial tear is just as efficacious. Okay, now let's move on to evaporative loss dry eye. Remember, with evaporative loss dry eye, you make plenty of watery tears but the lipid, which should stabilize the aqueous on your tear film, isn't coming out of the meibomian glands correctly. Now, when you are a patient with evaporative loss dry eye, your symptoms are very similar. My eyes feel dry. Feels like there's something in my eye. My eyes are burning. It feels like I have to blink throughout the day to get clear vision. My eyes are red and irritated. My eyes just feel so tired. There is one symptom that you don't get in aqueous deficient dry eye, and that's that my eyes tear when they're irritated. So oftentimes people come with a complaint of tearing and we say, oh, your eyes are dry, and that doesn't make any sense. And the reason why it does make sense is if you're making plenty of aqueous, but the lipid isn't stabilizing the tear film and the tears are evaporating, your brain is recognizing, oh, my corneas are going to get injured. And so then it reflects tears. So you're trying to tear to keep enough fluid on the surface of your eye to keep your cornea from getting damaged. On examination for evaporative loss dry eye, you have plenty of tears when we measure by the Shermer strip. And when we put in the drops to stain your tears, what we do is we have you blink and then hold your eyes open and we can measure how many seconds it takes for your tears to evaporate. This is the flat part of an eye called eyelid called a lid margin. And in the flat part are those meibomian glands. And maybe you can see these teeny tiny little perfect dots that those are normal meibomian glands. Here you can clearly tell those are clogged, dramatically clogged meibomian glands where the meibom or the secretion is really clogged in the lid. The thing to remember here, there are some systemic associations with evaporative loss dry eye. Ocular rosacea has clogged sebaceous glands. And in ocular rosacea, we often are recommending more systemic or oral treatments, and we treat you more like a dermatologist would treat rosacea. Again, as we get older, our meibomian glands do not produce as well. There are postmenopausal hormonal changes that decrease the flow of meibom through our lids. But again, with men uh, as well, just getting older uh, contributes to evaporative loss dry eye. Recurrent styes are associated with clogged glands and can be associated with a Demodex. Demodex is a mite that grows on our skin. It has nothing to do with cleanliness. Everyone has Demodex. You don't like to think about it if you Google it, but everyone has bacteria and Demodex all over our skin. And it turns out that people with ocular rosacea or recurrent sty have an overgrowth of Demodex. Again, nothing to do with hygiene, but sometimes we have to target the Demodex. And then I think everyone can relate to this is that computer use, any prolonged electronic device use, Remember the recipe for tears is you needed every component and then you have to blink 22 times a minute. Well, when you measure people's blink rate at a computer, it goes down to six times a minute. So when your blink rate, you're really concentrating on that fabulous YouTube video, uh, your tears are evaporating and computer associated dry eye is a real significant uh, thing. Also, if you are uh, on the fence about having dry eye and then sit for a long time at the computer, a lot of us know at the end of a long day of charting, a long day of using our eyes at work on the computer, our eyes just feel so tired. And that's computer associated evaporative loss dry eye. So again, the lipid stabilizes the water film. So what we need to do is melt the lipid out of our meibomian glands. And how do we do that? 
Well, at room temperature, the mybum, the thickened mybum is sort of stuck in the eyelid. But when we heat up our lids, it helps that mybum come out of the mybomian glands. So a basic ear -E treatment is a warm compress. How do you do a warm compress? You know, when you take just a towel and you warm it up under the faucet and you put it on your eyes, it feels great. But it's the truth is, is the heat, it goes away in a few minutes. Uh, we don't, Bruder is a brand name. They don't, uh, we're not supported by Bruder, but it's a nice brand. It's a little seeds in, in the little um, mask and you put it in the microwave and it warms up. It feels really great. You don't have to buy that. You can use a clean dry sock and put in rice uh, that is not cooked and tie off your sock and put that in the microwave. And that keeps heat for, you know, three to five minutes is really nice. Just meditate, put it on your eyelids. It usually feels great. Whereas with aqueous deficient dry eye, I said, just pick whatever feels good. If you're obviously don't have time at a busy day of work to do a nice warm compress, we do want you to think about some lipid based artificial tears, some tears that have oil in the ingredient name. So here are some brand names that have mineral oil or castor oil. And again, it's an artificial tear that will supplement a little more oil to your tear film to help prevent evaporation. We do some things called environmental changes recommendation. These are onion goggles. So to keep you from tearing when you chop onions, what it does is it makes a chamber around your eyes. So if you just have to work for four hours tonight after this, and you know your eyes are gonna feel dry, you can put just put some onion goggles on your face or over your glasses and that creates a little chamber, a little moisture chamber. So your tears are less likely to evaporate. Again, this is a big deal. My eyes will be dry after this talk because I'm looking a little bit up at the camera. And I want you to just watch when I look, if I'm working on my computer all day, and if I'm looking up at you, look up the camera, look at the surface of my eyes, how much room there is to evaporate. And if I move my camera down and I look down at the camera, what you can see is that all of a sudden there's much less surface area. So at the end of the day, when I have to sit and do my charting, the first thing I do is I move my whole monitor down. So I'm looking down and that really helps a lot. If you have a fan blowing on you in the office or at night, we really turn that off. Sometimes we can squeeze your meibomian glands just to get them going if they're clogged. So this is called meibomian gland expression. You can see that just sort of squeezing out and popping there. We can do that in the clinic with the forceps. There are many different sort of expensive ways to warm up your eyelid with uh, different devices that warm and squeeze. Essentially, there's some type, there, to be fair, one doesn't really work better than the other, um, but we want heat and expression of your lids. Uh, Evaporative loss dry eye can also be inflamed. And the first picture you see just clogged glands. And the second picture you see those red lines, those are blood vessels. Those can be really inflamed and that's called meibomian gland clogging. That is associated with eyelid margin inflammation. And that combination on that flat part, that lid margin of gland clogging and inflammation is called posterior blepharitis. So bleph is eyelid and itis is inflammation. And many of us use as a synonym for posterior blepharitis, ocular rosacea means your sebaceous glands, which are my bone glands are clogged and inflamed. And in these instances where things are warm and clogged and sticky, you get an overgrowth of normal flora. So we all have bacteria all over us. It's not that you have an infection, but we have staph and uh, that maybe, for example, staph and strep that grow on our skin. But if you culture someone with ocular rosacea, they'll grow more staph and strep than is normal. So in that instance, we are sometimes using antibiotic drops or just to decrease the overgrowth of normal flora. We're often using steroid drops to decrease the lid margin inflammation. And again, when you have true ocular rosacea, we're often talking about oral therapy. A little pandemic comment is this is new, this mask associated dry eyes, we all have it. And we have all this bl air blown up in our eyes all day long. And so just remember to wear your glasses over your mask or your mask tucked under your glasses. Oftentimes in the operating room, we will place tape uh, over our nose just to keep our glasses from getting fogged up. There are also special mask inserts that you can put in, but mask associated dry eyes and evaporative loss, that's sort of new to us all. And I just wanna say, if you are, giving yourself artificial tears and you're giving yourself warm compresses and you have seen someone and you're treating the inflammatory component and you still just don't feel good and your eyes feel dry, there could be other ocular surface contributors to dry eye. Remember this whole sort of picture where it's mostly aqueous and evaporative. And if you're doing everything, there could be something else. Um, 
my uh, timing is a little off here, but if, if you look at the first picture with the clog glands and the vessels, you can see that the eyelashes look sort of clean coming off the skin, but in the second picture, they're sort of crusty. And that crust is called anterior blepharitis. So sometimes there's extra skin or an infection on the eyelashes. And in those instances, we want you to scrub your eyelids so we can scrub with medicated antibiotic scrubs, or there are certain over-the-counter scrubs that we'll recommend. Now, not everyone needs to scrub their eyelashes. You don't need regular eyelash hygiene, just washing your face is normal. But if you have all this crustiness, you do need to scrub your eyelids. There's a very specific pattern to Demodex where the the crust actually encircles the eyelash. We call that a sleeve. And in that instance, we um, have very specific Demodex treatments that we recommend. Lastly, if you're just not responding to dry eye treatment, uh, this is somebody whose eyes are itching and they can't keep their hands away. And this is a terrible allergy season right now. We often flip your eyelid upside down, inside out, and we see tiny little red dots called papillae. And this is the teardrop standing around these tiny little bumps. And this is a sign of allergic eye disease. And so here we don't wanna use warm to make the meibomian glands produce more meibom, but we wanna use cool because things don't itch as well when they're as much when they're cold. We recommend your artificial tears coming out of the refrigerator. That feels good. And there's many different types of over-the-counter, no side effect to any of these antihistamine drops. <clears throat> and then there is a new preservative free antihistamine drop that came out a few months ago. So in conclusion, uh, we love the cornea. We love to talk about it. The dry eye is a real umbrella term. It means something different to everyone who talks about it, but hopefully now you can see it from the eyes of a cornea specialist, that there are many different components to the dry eye. When we examine you, we try to break it up into the components of the tear film and see which component needs help and how we can help you feel better. And one of the amazing parts of being a cornea specialist and thinking about dry eye is the health of the tears even can reveal a lot about the health of the whole body. So that is a dry talk on dry eyes. And with that, I will stop. We can stretch our legs for just a moment. I will um, turn the baton over to my bright and talented colleague, Dr. Julie Shellhorn, who will review the clarity of the cornea in more detail and then talk about surgeries of the cornea. Take it away, Julie. Thanks so much, Jeremy. That was really, really amazing. You know, I'd never actually thought about the angling your head thing, but that's very brilliant. So I will start advising my patients of that. So thank you for that great talk. All right, so bringing clarity to the cornea part two. So as Jeremy alluded earlier, I'm gonna talk a little bit about corneal physiology, uh, just so we can kind of get on the same page as to why we need to do surgery on the cornea in the first place. So meet the cornea again, like Jeremy said earlier, you know, you don't, when it's functioning, you don't even know it's there. When you look in somebody's eyes, you don't see it. And that's because it's totally clear, which is an amazing thing. It's also amazing, you know, it's about, you know, 11 to 12 millimeters wide or in diameter really. And at its, at its center, it's about half a millimeter thick. So we have a whole branch of medicine devoted to something that is effectively clear and, you know, smaller than the size of the tip of my pinky, which is amazing, but it is such an important part of the body. It, it, it does so much for you. So let me try and kind of share some of my enthusiasm for you. So uh, backing up, when we talk about the cornea, is, here it is with, uh, Jeremy was talking earlier about a device called the slit beam, which uh, lets us look with this very, very thinly focused light to get an idea of what's going on inside the cornea. So this is the cornea here. You can kind of see it arching over the iris here. And then this structure right here, which is part of the pupil is normally the lens. And that structure is actually composed of many, many different layers. There is the, starting at the outside, there's the epithelium, which is kind of the skin of the cornea. Uh, there's Bowman's layer, which is this thick uh, kind of like fibrous tissue that makes up the front part of the cornea. The stroma, which really is the meat of the cornea. And then this very, very, very specialized layer of cells on the back of the cornea called the endothelium. And we'll go through those layers and talk about why they are important. So what does the cornea do? Why is it so important? And it has three main functions that are totally essential for, for vision. Number one, it's a barrier against the external environment. Uh, you know, it keeps, it protects the inside of the eye and lets a clear window in. It provides a smooth refractive surface. Light, you know, when light enters the eye, the first tissue that it interacts with is the cornea. 
So it, um, it is responsible for shaping those light beams and focusing them perfectly so you can actually perceive them and actually see them. And it's completely and totally transparent when it's healthy, which is kind of amazing. So, all right, how does, let's go, let's go through those functions. Number one, a barrier to the environment. When you think of barrier to the environment, you know, you look at your hands, ah, skin, right? It's kind of like skin, not like skin at all. The cornea is very, very different than skin. Um, one of the reasons why cornea is different from the skin and the, the, the barrier that is different from the skin is how it heals. Think about it. If you get a cut on your skin, if you get a substantial scratch, you heal with a pretty, like, pretty big scar. If you get a scratch on the surface of your eye, you can get a scar, which is a cross section here showing some scarring the stroma, but the surface of the cornea, the surface epithelium, those, those cells on the very outer layer kind of magically grow back in meet each other and even compensate for any deformity caused in the surface underneath by the injury. And it remains totally clear when it's doing this. Now those cells, and these are the same cells that kind of look draggedy and dry uh, when you get dry eyes, uh, those cells are regenerated here at the edge of the cornea, right where it runs into the white part of the eye, which is called the limbus of the eye. And they're constantly turning over. There are cells out here called the limbal stem cells that are constantly dividing and dividing and dividing. And those cells, as they divide, migrate centrally in the cornea and recoat the cornea, which is this amazing, regenerative, totally clear layer. Now, if you look at this picture here, you can kind of just see those squirrels ever so lightly because this, the, the, the patient um, in this picture actually has a condition called Fabry's disease, um, in which those, those cells um, carry a little bit of pigmentation along with them. But you can see that migratory pattern here in that swirling of the epithelium, which is totally amazing. All right. The cornea is also super densely innervated. And this is really actually very, very important for maintaining its clarity and its structure. The cornea is one of the most densely innervated tissues in the body. And that is so important because the surface of the cornea is having it in a, being in perfect condition in that perfect smooth condition is so important for vision that even small injuries, rubbing it with a tissue, um, rubbing it with your finger, if you were to accidentally scratch yourself, it can have a really, really big impact on vision. So um, the nerves of the cornea are hypersensitive to, to touch and to pain. And if anybody's ever accidentally scratched their eye before or been poked in their eye by say Draymond Green in a, um, in, a, in a basketball game, you know it really, really hurts. Those nerves are also so important because they have a reflex, a reflex a feedback loop uh, with um, your eyelids so that when you get evaporative tear loss and your eyes start feeling dry, you blink your eyes. And those nerves are critical. And we see a lot of conditions where people lose sensation for a variety of uh, reasons. And those, uh, those end up becoming actually uh, very difficult conditions to treat. Okay, moving on to essential function number two, a smooth refractive surface. Much like, you know, the cornea is very, is you know, much like this picture of, of Mount Rainier refracting in a lake. Um, on when the surface is totally smooth, you can get this beautiful mirror-like reflection. Uh, you know, images are refracted perfectly. But if the surface is rough and bumpy, your image goes terrible. A big reason for that actually in a lot of people is dry eye, just this, even the surface being somewhat dry can really result in a lot of like image quality distortion that typically fluctuates throughout the day and even from blink to blink, um, which can be treated uh, by treating all those, those wonderful treatments that Dr. Seitzman just talked about. And this is, this is so important because, you know, most of the refractive power of the eye, you know, we saw that schematic of the eye earlier with light being focused from the front part of the eye to the back of the eye. Um, a lot of people think that, well, I have a lens in my eye. That's what actually does the refracting power, but that's not totally true. The majority of the refracting power actually comes from the cornea. Um, so much, your, your cornea effectively is like a really high quality, super fancy lens, like in your SLR cameras. Um, that, that is really what's doing the refract, the, the, that intense refractive uh, uh, focusing of light. And that's because light um, bends, is, is bent most when it goes from um, uh, uh, material of different, uh, different optical densities. So going from air to the cornea, for instance, light really, really bends a lot. Whereas going from inside the eye to water to the lens, it doesn't bend as much. So your cornea is really, really important to refraction. Much like your fancy SLR lens, the shape of the cornea is incredibly important because it is a lens. 
And if you've ever looked through a funny shaped lens, you know, those funny mirrors at a fun house or even, you know, through like the side of like a fish aquarium, one of those bull fish aquariums, you know that light passing through an irregularly shaped lens can cause a lot of visual distortion. So any perturbation in the shape of the cornea, um, not just its smooth surface, but in the shape of it can be really, 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 really visually significant. Um, a, 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 the, probably the primary cause that we see of this is, uh, is a condition called keratoconus where, you know, looking at this, you're like, gosh, yeah, it's kind of like round. It looks like a lens. You know, it, it doesn't, doesn't look that strange to me, but um, it's much, much steeper here than it is out here. Uh, if you really, really look at a detailed shape map of it. And that just has massive, massive repercussions on how well you can see. So, so the, the, the shape of the, the, this cornea is, is just incredibly important to your vision. Moving on to clarity now. The cornea is totally clear in its healthy state. It's like a window, it's kind of amazing. And how does it do it? How does your body make something that has like a strong fiber structure but, made, but stays totally clear? And the answer really become, uh, comes because the cornea just is incredibly uh, organized. And there are, it's basically, it's mainly made of collagen. And the collagen fibrils, these, these uh, which are just collagen kind of wound around itself into these big, big thicker fibers. The collagen fibrils are held at these exact spacing distances by these things called proteoglycans, which are little um, proteins with sugars on the end of it that kind of interact with one another and act as like little um, spacing rods between these collagen fibrils. And then these rods of collagen fibrils are then arranged in sheets that are super regularly spaced on one top of another. And what you think, you know, why does it, why does it matter that it's so, so, uh, so well structurally organized? How, how does that, how does that actually make it clear? And this is really, really cool for, for the, for the physics nerds out there. Um, light can be both a particle and a wave, right? If we think back to like our high school physics classes, uh, when waves interact, when, when waves of the same frequency and where their peaks and valleys are lined up interact, you get a bigger wave amplitude overall. But if you shift the wave so that a peak of light is lining up with a valley of light, you cancel the wave out. And effectively, as light is passing into your cornea and hitting these collagen fibrils, the light that gets reflected back, back towards you, uh, you know, away from your eye um, towards somebody else, uh, that light under, is reflected in such a way that its wavelength is shifted and you get no backscatter of light. So the cornea looks totally transparently clear as light is coming in, which is kind of amazing. So the spacing of these collagen fibrils is what makes this happen. And because that spacing is so important, anything that perturbs the spacing can make the cornea uh, not transparent anymore. And that brings us to this structure here, which is called the corneal endothelium. The corneal endothelium is a really, really unique uh, structure in the eye and, and, and in the body. Um, it is a single layer of cells that are stuck to the back of the cornea. And these cells are packed super duper, duper, duper densely. And they actually look like little hexagons. And that's because when you pack, um, pack something that's like flat together, the highest density that you can get when you pack it together is a hexagon. So it looks like a honeycomb on the back of the cornea. And the whole purpose of these cells is as water, you know, there's water inside the eye and there's no water outside the eye. The whole purpose of these cells is to prevent that water that's in the front part of the, the anterior chamber. It's not technically water, but it's very similar to that, is to basically pump it back out and keep the stroma clear, uh, keep, keep the stroma of the cornea dehydrated. And remember that if the stroma of the cornea gets swollen, those spacing of those collagen fibers will change and the cornea becomes cloudy. So this works really, really well, except what happens if you lose endothelial cells? Well, if you lose a few, you're probably fine. If you use a few more, you're, you're probably fine because you know the endothelial cells that are next to it kind of get bigger and move over. These cells never replicate. So when you lose them, the neighboring cells, they're not like skin, they're not gonna redivide and kind of fill in the gaps, but the remaining cells will kind of like get bigger and try and take up that space. But at some point, you kind of overwhelm the ability. If you lose enough cells, you overwhelm the ability of the remaining cells to pump water to the cornea and the cornea gets swollen. 
And as the cornea gets swollen, you space out these collagen fibro fibrils in an irregular way. And you start, you see they're nice and compact here and they're really, really spread out here. And you can see that you start losing um, that, that negative interference and the cornea becomes opaque. So while it's nice and clear here in this, in this, um, this uh, experiment, uh, swollen cornea becomes very, very cloudy. The most common condition that we see with this is something called Fuchs endothelial dystrophy. Um, this is a, uh, it's actually a, a hereditary disease, um, variable penetrance. So, you know, some people have it much, much worse. Some people have it really not that bad at all. Um, but it's a disease where your endothelial cells die off at a faster rate than, than kind of what is normal. And people can develop swelling in the cornea. All right, so moving on, what happens when you have a problem with the cornea? What happens if it gets cloudy, if it gets scarred, if the shape becomes abnormal? Well, then we do surgery to try and fix it. And there's a lot of different kinds of surgeries um, uh, on your cornea that you can do. And if you've ever talked to a corneal specialist or you know, heard us at one of our meetings, there are just so many acronyms that we'd like to talk about. DMEC, DSEC, DWEC, DLEC, PKP, ALK, DALK, KPRO. Uh, you know, those are all very, very confusing to think about. Um, what, what really works to think about is you know, uh, what the underlying problem is and how we can treat that specific problem. So this is a concept called lamellar corneal surgery. Like we talked about earlier, the cornea is composed of you know, a surface epithelium, that, that, that skin type area, the stroma, which is our collagen, and then desmase, desmase membrane endothelium. And that, those are really the, the three primary layers that we can do surgery on. Um, surgery on the epithelium is pretty specialized and there, there, are, there are few specific cases that we really need to do that in because for most people, your epithelium continually regenerates. And even if you have surgery on the cornea, your own natural epithelium will come in to cover it. There are, there are cases where people lose the ability to regenerate their epithelium. And then um, we, do, we do some very specialized things for those, for those people. But um, for, uh, for most people, um, if you do need corneal surgery, it is usually a problem either with the stroma or your endothelium or both, okay? So endothelial problem, we treat that nowadays with an endothelial transplant, which is kind of amazing. It's a single layer of cells, those, those hexagonal cells that we talked about earlier that just line the back layer of the cornea. And if you lose those hexagonal cells for a variety of reasons and your cornea gets swollen, we treat that really just with replacing those cells that are on the back of the cornea, not with replacing your whole cornea which is pretty cool. And so we, what we do is we take out the disease portion, the portion that's not working, and we've put a new layer of endothelium in, um, which, is, which is great. Um, this is something called a decimase stripping endothelial keratoplasty or a decimase membrane endothelial keratoplasty, DSEC or DMEC in our alphabet soup. Um, decimase membrane endothelial keratoplasty refers just to that layer of cells and then the membrane they sit upon. Uh, a decimase stripping endothelial keratoplasty, you transplant member, uh, me uh, that membrane of cells and then a little tiny bit of the stromal tissue too. Um, there are specific um, situations where one is preferred to another um, and it depends a, a little bit on, on what prior surgeries that you've had in your eye and, and a few other factors. But, but for all intents and purposes, they, people end up recovering very, very well from both of them. They're, 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 they're really fairly equivalent. Now, how do you get those cells to sit the back of the cornea? Because if you think about it, you know, you're sitting upright, your corneas are facing forward. How do you get the cells to stick? Um, if it, especially if it's just a single layer of cells, we can't put stitches through a single layer of cells. You know, what, how do we get them on the back of the cornea? Well, it's pretty cool. We put in the new layer of cells and then we put a bubble inside the eye, either of gas or of air. And that bubble floats up against the cells. It pushes them into place. It gives a chance for those endothelial cells, those healthy cells that we just transplanted to start pumping, to take the water of the cornea and they kind of suck themselves under the back of the cornea and become stuck. And then your body dissolves the bubble, naturally goes away and you're left with a new layer of cells which is pretty darn cool. The advantages of the endothelial transplant um, are many really. If it's, you just have an endothelial problem, it's really the preferred technique for surgery nowadays. Uh, you typically have a much, much quicker recovery um, between one and three months, um, depending upon you know, how you heal, how your transplant heals. Instead of about a year, if we could transplant the whole cornea, it doesn't really affect your glasses prescription very much. Your, your, your curvature of the outside part of your cornea stays the same. 
Um, so, so you really don't induce a lot of refractive error with it, which is really, really nice. There's a lower risk of rejection, particularly if we are just able to transplant that, that single monolayer of cells. There's also a lower risk of glaucoma. So if you have an endothelial problem, uh, the endothelial transplant is really the ideal surgery. The downside is that you have to position because bubbles, you have that bubble in the eye. The bubble stays there uh, between a day and like four days, um, depending upon the type of bubble we use. And much like, you know, if you've ever used a spirit level where you turn the level to one side or another and the bubble kind of like rocks back and forth, um, the bubble inside of your eye is doing the same thing. So in order to get that bubble to push right up against the front part of your cornea, you have to be flat on your back and you have to stay there. Um, you know, you can, you can get up and, and, you know, use the restroom if you need to and to eat, but um, no pillows underneath your head, um, no lifting the head of the bed up. You can put pillows underneath your feet, but, but that, that positioning on your back is really important for the first part of that surgery. Okay. The other downside of the endothelial transplant is that sometimes the cells don't stick all the way and part of the transplant can peel off. You know, it's, a, it's not terribly uncommon, actually. About 5% or about 1 in 20 people will have a graft attachment. If that happens, you know, we go back in and put another bubble in, kind of help it stick up. Um, about 1 in 100 people will have what we call primary graft failure, which is the cells just didn't like being transplanted. They didn't survive surgery sometimes, you know, because we have to peel off a cell layer from the, from the donor um, who's passed away. Um, that can be, some cells just don't do well with that. Um, and if that happens, then we got to go back in and, and replace a transplant. And, you know, people do very, very well with their, their second surgery if that does happen. So what type of conditions can we treat with this? Um, there's a lot. Um, really, it's any type of corneal edema where that back layer of cells isn't working. Probably the most common thing that we see is Fuchs endothelial dystrophy, that congenital condition, not congenital, that, that hereditary condition we talked about earlier where you just lose your endothelial cells at a faster rate than average. Some people also develop corneal edema after having cataract surgery, especially if it's like a really, really, really advanced cataract, um, or having multiple surgeries previously. They've had, you know, retinal detachments and glaucoma surgery. All of that can take a little bit of toll on the corneal endothelium, and sometimes you will just end up um, developing edema. Um, or if you had a corneal, tra corneal transplant previously and you had a possibly a rejection or, you know, you just lost a lot of cells from it, um, that's another thing that we can do an endothelial transplant. So people that have had full thickness transplants for conditions, you know, 30, 40 years ago, if their graft is not, is becoming swollen because that back layer of cells is not working, we'll do just nowadays just an endothelial transplant, granted that the, given that the rest of the graft is, is functioning well. All right, moving on. If you have a stromal problem, the solution to that is to replace the stroma, something called a lamellar cataplasty. So if you have a stay, your, your endothelium is totally fine. Here's the kind of schematic of your cornea again. Your endothelium is totally fine, but you've got a scar in the stroma or you've got some type of abnormality in the stroma. We can basically just take off the stroma that doesn't work and then just replace it with a, a donor layer of stroma. The advantage is, this is something called a deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty or a DALC in our, in, our, in our terminology. So the advantage of that is that because you're preserving your natural endothelium, that back layer of the cornea is still yours, there's a less risk of rejection. There's a less risk that your body will see, hey, I see cells that aren't part of me and I'm going to send my immune system to attack them. You can still get a rejection of the stroma, but it turns out it's actually less common, which is, which is nice. Um, the downside of the lamellar keratoplasty, it's a lengthy healing process. It's about a year to take care of it. Um, it's also really technically difficult to do. Sometimes we can't separate the stroma off that, that back layer of cells. Sometimes it's really, really tightly adhered, and we have to transplant the whole, the whole, thick, the whole thickness of the cornea. Um, that's something called a dulk. And the, the, what we do typically do this for is if you have a scar in your cornea, we'll do that for it or if you have keratoconus where the problem is just the structural integrity is causing the cornea to kind of bow forward unusually, uh, we, will, we will do a lamellar, lamellar keratoplasty or a dulk. Okay, moving on, the full thickness corneal, tra uh, corneal transplant, penetrating keratoplasty or PKP. With this one, it's kind of what it sounds like. You've got a problem in the cornea. We take out that section of the cornea and we give you a new section of cornea and a new section of decimase membrane kind of attached to it. Um, you know, about, 15 years ago, this was, the, you know, yeah, about 15 years ago, this was really the only type of transplant that people would do. They would just, everybody would get a full thickness transplant. 
Um, and then we really had a blossoming of these lamellar transplant techniques, which have just been so helpful in getting people to heal well. But if you need a full thickness transplant, it is still a really, really good surgery. Typically we'll do this surgery if you have a problem in your stroma and a problem in your endothelium, or if you've, you know, developed a, a huge amount of scarring in your cornea and Desmase membrane is, is really stuck down to it. So things that we do full thickness transplants for, you know, if you had a really bad infection in the eye and you developed a lot of scarring from the infection, um, we'll do a full thickness transplant for that. If you had, um, you know, a bad injury, you got a really, really bad cut or a burn on the cornea that, that really caused a full thickness injury, we'll do a full thickness corneal transplant for that. And it's a very, very effective surgery. A really common question I get asked is, you know, how do you plan for corneal surgery? You know, corneal transplant is a transplant procedure. You know, the corneas the, and the corneal tissue come from people that have passed away that have donated um, their organs. And it's, it's really an amazing thing. Um, you know, how come it's not like a liver transplant or a kidney transplant? You know, I know people that have been on those for years. Um, we're really, really, really fortunate here in the United States. I mean, for, for many reasons, but uh, one of the things we're, we're extremely, you know, fortunate for in, in terms of, of corneal blindness is um, we really have a very robust system of eye banks. And eye banks, um, when somebody passes away and um, their loved ones decide to, to donate their organs, um, the eye bank will come, they'll, they'll assess the corneal health, um, assess if the person's a good donor, and then they'll, they'll take the cornea with them and they store it back at the eye bank. And corneas, because you know, unlike a heart or a kidney or liver, the surface of your eye and your cornea really gets oxygen mainly from the air. So its cells remain viable even after somebody has, somebody's heart has stopped beating. So the cornea can be taken then back to the eye banks and then um, stored and they, they keep it in this very, very special uh, media to keep it healthy. And it can actually be viable for up to two weeks under those conditions, um, which is truly amazing. Um, and, you know, and it's just, you know, so many people in the United States are so generous with donating their organs when they, they pass away that we really don't have a shortage of corneal tissue and we're pretty much able to schedule surgery on demand. You know, I've, I've never actually had to have a surgery canceled um, because we haven't had corneal tissue. Um, this is not the case in the rest of the world. You know, I, I have colleagues in China who have people on wait lists for years and years um, waiting for an, an organ donor, um, but we are just extremely fortunate that you know, A, so many people are organ donors, and B, we have this really, really strong and robust network of, of eye banks. So, you know, just as a, as a, as a, as a, 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 a separate announcement there, you know, um, really consider becoming an organ donor, um, you know, if and when you do, you know, pass away. Um, it can really transform people's life, um, and, and, you know, in terms of eyes and, and in, for everything else. And, you know, even if you can just don't donate your eyes, it, it is, you um, you know, it, it really makes my job possible and it, and it gives people the ability to see again, which is a huge, huge gift. So we are very fortunate for that reason. So after care for corneal transplants, what do you need to be worried about? You know, the biggest concern, both short and long-term is rejection. These are donated cells. Your body could recognize that they're not part of you and attack them with your immune system. Um, most people need to be on anti-rejection medications long-term. Some people are able to come off of them. Uh, it's a little bit of an individualized uh, discussion when it comes to that. Um, the mainstay of um, anti-rejection medications in corneal transplants are topical steroids, actually more potent ones than the ones Dr. Seisman was talking about earlier, um, but topical steroids, steroids nonetheless, which is really, really nice because steroids, you know, especially pills that you take steroids have a lot of really bad side effects. So if you're having a, you know, solid organ transplant, a kidney transplant or a liver transplant, um, you can't just be on steroids your whole life to, to, to reject, to, to prevent rejection. Um, because of all the horrendous side effects that come with oral steroids. Fortunately, localized to the eyes, steroids actually are, are quite tolerable for most people. They can cause eye pressure to go up, and glaucoma is a concern if you have a corneal transplant, particularly a full thickness corneal transplant, and that's something that we monitor for and watch for closely, and, and, if, and if people do start developing um, eye pressure problems, then we, you know, we address that appropriately. But, um, but we are really quite fortunate, um, again, with that, that we're able to just treat localized without exposing your whole body to these very, very um, potent immunosuppressive medications. So that is all I've got today. Um, if you want uh, some more information, um, you can check us out at ophthalmology.ucsf.edu or come visit us in our beautiful new building at uh, 490 Illinois Street. 
So thank you very, very much for your attention. And uh, thank you for listening to me be excited about the eyes. Thanks. Thank you guys. That was awesome. That was really great. Uh, Jeremy, this one will go to you. Um, how can you differentiate aqueous deficient dry eye and uh, mybobian gland dysfunction? So the aqueous comes out of the lacrimal gland and the meibomian glands uh, create the lipid tears. So with aqueous deficient dry eye, you're not making the water. And in general, we use those strips called the Shermer strips to measure what tear production you have. Now, Shermer strips are not the most accurate measurement, meaning that if I measure your Shermer strip recording on one Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, you would have a different number of millimeters per five minutes. But in general, what we're looking for when we put the little strips in your eyes and have you close your eyes for five minutes and measure how much aqueous you make is are you making none or very little or do you make a ton? Because ocular rosacea people, for example, fill those strips. So if somebody met, puts the little strips in your um, lid and you fill them up, we know you're not aqueous deficient. For MGD, which is called meibomian gland dysfunction, we can actually examine your meibomian glands at the microscope and oftentimes we'll press on it. And so in a perfect state, the, so the secretion that comes out of your eyelid looks a little bit more like oil, like olive oil. Uh, and then uh, if it's really looks more like toothpaste coming out of it, then we know that you have a meibomian gland dysfunction. Thanks. A um, couple of questions on steroids. So first is how would you distinguish mild versus strong? Is there a percentage in what's considered mild? Um, and then just when it comes to long-term steroids uh, for dry eyes, would you do that even for patients that have glaucoma? Okay, let's talk about that separately. It's not as easy as looking at the percentage strength. So that doesn't, you can't go 1% versus 1% or 5% or 10%. It doesn't work that way. It ends up being the chemical structure of the drop and how well it binds to water and lipid and fat and penetrates through all the structures of the eye. So there's no way by looking at a bottle that you would just know, oh, my doctor gave me a mild or a moderate. We know from the chemical structure. So for example, the most potent, and when I use the word potent, I mean, how well does the steroid drop get through the whole eyeball and get inside the eyeball? Because there are many diseases where we need the inside of the eye to calm down down as far as inflammation. The most potent steroid drop there is on the market is called brand name Durazol, which is generic diflupredinate. And then after that comes a drug called Predforte, which is prednisolone acetate. They get into the eye very well. So their risk of having a steroid induced high eye pressure is much higher. And so there's a list of them and we sort of know them when you use all the different, but to be fair, the people who use the, who really think about the potency of steroid drops are often cornea specialists. A lot of people just say, oh, just use this steroid and they'll just pick whatever steroid that they can think of or is the cheapest or your insurance covers. But cornea specialists, we're often perseverating. We just need the cornea to get on the eye. We don't need it to get in the eye. So the weakest, the least potent steroid drop that's available is one called fluoromethylone. And that's a long word. We don't like saying it all the time. So we call it FML. So sort of in order of potency, there's a fluoromethylone class, and then comes a lodoprednol class, and then comes a dexamethasone and a prednisolone phosphate and a prednisolone acetate. And I don't think it's important for you to know which is which, but I think it is reasonable for you as a patient to ask when someone is giving you a steroid for a dry eye condition. Now, that's not a steroid for corneal transplant rejection, as Dr. Shavlin was talking about. It's not a steroid after cataract surgery, but a steroid for a dry eye, I think it's reasonable for you to say, is this a high potency steroid or is this a mild potency steroid? And ask for a mild potency steroid. They work just as well for dry eye. So sometimes you have to ask about that. Now, how do you get glaucoma? There are many different types of glaucoma. When your eye pressure is elevated for a long period of time, like a, a, a tire has a pressure, an eyeball has a pressure, and you don't feel this kind of pressure. It's a measurement that we take at the office. When the eye pressure is elevated for a long period of time, it can damage the optic nerve, which is a structure in the back of the eye. And when the optic nerve is damaged, slowly over time, your peripheral vision comes in. So typically, there's a lot of time to figure out if this is happening. A drug has to increase your eye pressure, it has to stay high, maybe undiagnosed, or this is why we wanna see you frequently. It has to stay high and not be treated for a long period of time. And then it could develop into glaucoma. 
If you take a steroid and your eye pressure never gets elevated, you don't develop steroid-induced glaucoma. The number has to be high. So if you have glaucoma, but you took a mild potency drop and we follow you very closely if we know you have glaucoma, because if you have glaucoma, you're more likely to have a steroid-induced eye pressure rise. But if you had glaucoma and it was well-controlled on your medication or path through your surgery, and then we gave you a mild potency steroid drop and we follow you and your eye pressure doesn't go up, you're good. Nothing bad will happen. Also, if you do develop high eye pressure and we measure it, we say, oh, boo, your eye pressure went up. We take away the steroid and then almost always your eye pressure goes back down to normal. Um, okay, so a bunch of questions on dry eyes. So just in terms of drops and treat, treatment, uh, what about washing the eye with saline solution? Any negative effects with that? Washing your eyelids with kind of like a water, uh, you know, even like a gentle, you know, detergent, um, such as like a, a really mild soap can be okay. Um, the surface of your eyes, you typically don't need to wash or rinse out a lot unless you get something in the eye. Um, you know, uh, using, if you're feeling dry or irritated, using an artificial tear can be really, really helpful to get rid of that feeling, but rinsing it out is not going to help you out so much. And that's because, you know, your tears are actually a really, really complex structure that kind of enables them to spread out evenly over the surface of the eye and, and, and form that nice stable um, surface coating. And if you introduce a lot of other uh, fluids into the tear film, you're, you're, you're not introducing the same stuff that makes up your normal tear film. You can dilute out those helpful proteins, those, those helpful lipids that, that really make your, your tear stable. So unless you specifically have something in the eye, um, doing a, a serious wash of the eye itself is not really called for. Now it's different than washing your eyelids with your eyes closed. You take water, a washcloth, and just gently scrub there. That is totally okay to do, but you don't need to rinse the eyes out regularly. Do you agree with that, Jeremy? I agree completely. That is not a part of the body that needs routine rinsing. Exactly. And then do loss of eyelashes affect dry eye? So eyelashes are there to protect us so that dust and things in the environment don't fall into our eyes. So loss of eyelashes do not cause dry eye, but when you have infection and inflammation around your eyelashes. So for example, we talked about anterior blepharitis where you can get an infection of your eyelashes or crusty skin around your eyelashes. With chronic inflammation around your eyelashes, you can get eyelash loss. So if your lashes are falling out, that's something that we would look at at the microscope is to see if you have anterior blepharitis. Now, remember when you have anterior blepharitis, you have all that deposit along the eyelashes. Some of that can fall into your eye. So it sort of feels like you have something in there all the time because the debris can fall in. So anterior blepharitis can masquerade as dry eye because it makes it feel like there's something in there at all the time. Can cold, you know, you talked about warm compresses, can cold compresses close the meibomian glands? Yes, it can make the secretions not be as thin. But, you know, a lot of people have meibomian gland dysfunction and allergic eye disease. So then what do you do, right? Because the warm compresses can melt out the meibom, the secretion. We know at room temperature, if you have meibomian gland dysfunction, your secretions are thick. And so heat sort of can make that go. And then if you also have allergic eye disease, we want you to cool down the lid, which then counteracts the effect of the lipid. So sometimes you just have to decide which symptom is bothering you most today. If you don't use warm compresses for three weeks, it's not as though your meibomian glands will die and go away and you'll go blind. That doesn't happen. So if you have sort of evaporative lost dry eye and you're on the computer a lot, and sometimes you just need to use a warm compress to melt out the meibomian glands, that's great. But then it comes spring, for example, this spring, it's a terrible. I think we just haven't had a lot of rain and whatever is blooming is affecting so many people. And if you're just itching out of control, then it's much better to use cool compresses to calm down the itching because we, all ophthalmologists and especially cornea specialists, do not like your fingers by your eyes. We don't like your fingers. They're dirty. I know you think you wash your hands. You don't wash your hands as well as you think you wash your hands. We do not like eye rubbing. Eye rubbing causes a whole host of corneal problems and corneal infections and eyelid issues. We do not like you rubbing. We would much rather you use cool compresses regardless of the status of your meibomian glands so that you don't itch. We'll agree with that. And Dr. Shalhorn's nodding your head also. 
Um, okay, is it dry eye when you close your eyes and feel a stiffness? No, that's just an unusual sensation. And some people just are very sensitive to their eyes. There are some times that your eyes just don't feel normal. And that's sort of also normal. And I do want to also address sometimes people get like a sharp stabbing pain through their eye. That's really alarming. It feels like a knife and a sword going through. It's really alarming. And you think, oh my gosh, something terrible is happening. I just would like to throw out there that that is not alarming. That's a very common thing every once in a while, because as Dr. Schellhorn was talking, the eye is so richly innervated. Something, some little tiny drop of dryness or some allergen or some irritant just makes all the nerves fire at once and you get a sharp stabbing eye pain and it absolutely means nothing. It's very common. It sometimes takes your breath away and you think, oh my gosh, what was that? And if you're prone to worry, you're going to worry that something bad is going to happen. But I can assure you that is a very common symptom and you don't have to worry about it. So I'm going to do a two-part question here and just combine two. So one is how do contact lenses affect the cornea? And then the second part is what is the latest thinking about the practice of using hard contact lenses to reshape the cornea? Yeah, so contact lenses are, are really interesting. And, you know, contact lenses really fall into two main branches. There's soft contact lenses, um, which is what most people wear, and then there's hard contact lenses. And they both affect the cornea in very, very different ways. So we'll talk about hard contact lenses when we talk about reshaping the cornea. Soft contact lenses basically fit over the cornea like a well-fitting glove, and they just change the contour of the cornea just a little bit to change that refraction um, as light enters the eye to, to focus and account for some refractive air. Um, because soft contact lenses really snug down and sit right on top of the eye, um, uh, your natural tears don't percolate underneath of them. They kind of percolate over the top. And remember, the cornea gets its oxygen, you know, mostly from the air, okay? And at nighttime when your eyes closed, it gets the, the oxygen from like this very, very rich network of blood vessels in the back of your eyelids. So in order for oxygen to get to your cornea through your contact lens, it actually has to dissolve from the air into the contact lens and then from the contact lens into your eye. So contact lenses um, all have varying amounts of oxygen permeability. Um, some are less permeable to oxygen, some are more permeable to oxygen. As cornea specialists, we really like contact lenses that are very, very, very permeable to oxygen because if you cut off oxygen from the surface of the cornea, you can get problems with your epithelium, it can break down. And if your epithelium breaks down, then you can get bacteria into there and that can cause an infection. It can also just cut off oxygen and your cells are like, help, I need oxygen. And that encourages blood vessels to grow in to the cornea, which is not good because cornea is supposed to be clear. Blood vessels are not good in the cornea. And then in really severe cases for, for really um, uh, people that have been wearing contact lenses for a really, really long time without good oxygen permeability, it can cut off um, those cells that regenerate and cover the surface of the eye and give you something called limbal stem cell deficiency, which is really, really tricky to, um, to, to, um, to treat. So contact lenses, soft contact lenses, um, uh, you know, the other thing is that the, especially depending upon where you are keeping them, they, um, you know, they're, they're in a warm, moist environment and warm, moist environments invite all sorts of like nasty bacteria to grow. Um, so it is very, very important to keep them in, uh, you know, change out your case routinely so you don't get bacteria that are kind of coating the case and follow the schedule that your optometrist gives you for your contact lenses. So if they tell you to put them in the morning and take them out the nighttime, do that. Don't sleep in them because you're cutting off oxygen for off the cornea for even longer. Um, you know, when you, if it's time to change them after a week or two weeks, change them out then. Don't push it longer. Um, as, as, as contact, as corneal specialists, we really like high oxygen permeability contact lenses and daily disposables. Ones that you put it in the morning and then you take out and you toss them in the trash can and never wear them again. Those are our, really our favorite. But our real favorite contact lenses actually are the hard contact lenses. And that's because hard contact lenses allow your tears to percolate both over the, surf, over the top and under the surface. And the best thing for the surface of your eye is your own natural tears. So keeping those natural tears around that hard contact lens are the best. They're also very, 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 very oxygen permeable, way more oxygen permeable than soft contact lenses. So you typically don't have any problems with um, ischemia of the surface from them. Now, reshaping the cornea using contact lenses uses hard contact lenses that basically don't fit well, actually, um, that you wear overnight to kind of push down on the top of the cornea and treat nearsightedness. 
uh, there is something called orthokeratology. Um, hard contact lenses or orthokeratology can be effective in treating low amounts, uh, low amounts of nearsightedness um, on the plus side so that you wear them overnight, you're you know, minus two, but during the day you're okay and then kind of regress slowly throughout the day and you put those orthokeratology lenses back in at nighttime. Um, there's also some literature suggesting that they can delay the progression of um, nearsightedness in kids. And that's in young kids around like, you know, seven to 12 years old. I personally don't love orthokeratology lenses because, you know, I only end up seeing the bad things that can happen from them um, because you're wearing contact lenses all night long. Uh, you can get infections with them, especially if you wash them in tap water, things that have amoebas or bacteria growing in them. You can get some really, really, really bad infections from orthokeratology. I know, Jeremy, we've seen several um, in young kids that have been being treated for, near, for myopia. Um, so I, it's, you know, I don't love them, uh, you know, but there is substantial uh, literature suggesting that they're they're effective. Um, there are a few questions on cataract surgery and dry eyes. So we'll start with, um, can cataract surgery exacerbate dry eye? And specifically, does the incision interrupt the integrity of the cornea and then increase the incidence of dry eyes? So the incision is required because the remember the lens is behind the colored part of the eye. So you, in order to have cataract surgery, you need an incision so that the instrumentation can go through the pupil to remove the lens. So the incision is a necessary part of cataract surgery and an incision in the cornea does not cause dry eyes. The incision will cause a little scratch in the cornea and in a normal situation, the skin the epithelium will heal right over the incision and you won't know anything about it. In general, most people do very well after cataract surgery. However, if you have dry eyes to begin with, remember we talked about a little bit that the preservatives in drops can cause exacerbation of symptoms. So after cataract surgery, you're often given a lot of drops at a reasonably high frequency in a short period of time. So take this drop four times a day, three times a day, two times with a taper. And so people who have a tendency to have dry eye, it is not uncommon for their eyes to feel completely different after cataract surgery. And in a way that's sort of hard to describe. I didn't have this problem before cataract surgery, but after cataract surgery, my eyes just feel different. And I think a lot of that is from preservative use of the drops. And then um, there's some other fancier things to think about that, you know, we, the worst thing that could possibly happen with any, in any surgery anywhere in the body is that the surgery would get infected. And we do all sorts of things to prevent an infection. But if you develop an infection after cataract surgery, that infection can be blinding. So we really feel strongly about antibiotics around the time of surgery to prevent uh, the uh, an, an infection after cataract surgery. It turns out in some people, it is possible that it could short term alter what we call a microbiome of the conjunctiva. So we think about a microbiome as the normal balance of all these different bugs that live in our body. And there's a certain homeostasis that keeps us healthy. And maybe when our stomachs get upset or we use too many pills, oral antibiotics, it can disrupt the microbiome. There's some indication that after cataract surgery, when you use uh, an antibiotic short term, it of course would alter the microbiome. And in general, given time, everybody resorts back to their normal state. But it is possible in a small subset of people who have some chronic ocular inflammatory condition at baseline that they could respond more negatively, or in other words, have an exacerbation of dry eye after cataract surgery. Kind of in relation to that. So this, um, I'll just read the question. I had LASIK surgery about 25 years ago, had a negative experience with dry eyes. Uh, UCS has helped, helped and plugged some ducts. And now at 75, I have AMD, which is slowly progressing and the beginnings of cataracts. So the question is at the right time, will I be able to have cataract surgery? So yes. <laughs> having had LASIK or, or AMD does not stop you from having cataract surgery and it will not cause any substantial problems for you. Um, previously, you know, a long time ago, no, not a long time ago, um, but you know, we had difficulty getting the interocular lens power correct after you had LASIK, um, but we have many ways around that now and people that have had LASIK have really excellent cataract surgery outcomes. So that should not uh, be an issue for you at all. Okay, can you speak to any supplements? Um that are in RCTs um, regarding dry eyes or the cornea? I don't know if anyone has an answer to that. <laughs> so 
couple, there's been one large randomized controlled trial speaking to a supplement, and that's omega-3 fatty acid for the use of dry eye. So when I said with the drops for stasis and Zydra, many people have very strong opinions. Many people have emotional attachments to omega-3 supplements for a wide variety of ailments. One of them is dry eye. It turns out there was a beautifully designed randomized control trial called the DREAM study, D-R-E-A-M, where people with dry eye were randomized to the placebo of omega-3 fatty acid or, um, or a treatment dose of omega-3 fatty acid, and they were followed for a really long period of time. And in the history of randomized controls trials, it happens to be a beautifully designed trial. And the conclusion is that omega-3 fatty acids for the treatment of dry eyes is not effective. Now that really bothers a lot of people because a lot of people take it and swear by it. But remember, as many people it helps is as many people as it doesn't help. And in the setting of this well-designed randomized control trial, it showed that, ran that omega-3 fatty acids probably isn't hurting you, but according to the randomized control data we have presently, it probably does not confer any benefit over dry eyes. Now, interestingly, the same year in New England Journal of Medicine that the omega-3 just showed no effect for the treatment of dry eyes, there were also two other landmark studies studying the use of omega-3 fatty acid to prevent stroke and heart disease, and I think even cancer mortality. And in fact, in all of those studies, the way that they were designed and looked at, omega-3 did not have any beneficial effect. Um, and yet everybody still takes it and everybody still recommends it. So that's something you really have to think about. Uh, think about the data that are available and think about just sort of discussing the literature that's available to uh, with your physicians. Um, but as far as dry eyes, that's the one big, huge supplement trial that we have. Um, and then um, we don't have any others. There's lots of little other over-the-counter and herbal supplements that may be beneficial, but we don't have great data or randomized controlled trials to guide you with them. Uh, we certainly wish we did. Um, and then just regarding dry eyes again, what about the use of eyeliners, mascara, and can they be used safely? They can, uh, because we are going to assume that the eyeliner and the mascara is not going on the eyeball itself. Um, it's a foreign body around your eyes. So if you are a sensitive allergy person, there may be certain type of brands that are good for you. And if that's the case, you need to figure out um, which ingredients you're reacting to. And then just remember, you know, you change your underwear every day, you wash your hands a lot. Where think right now where your eyeliner and mascara are stored, it's probably in your bathroom. So it's a good thing to replace it every now and again since things in your bathroom can get dirty. A couple more questions. Um, two are on the same, so I'll just either one of you guys can answer, but um, regarding map dot fingerprint dystrophy or epithelial basement dystrophy, um, what causes that? And can you speak to that? Just a couple words. Yeah, epithelial basement membrane dystrophy is a condition where those surface epithelial cells that we talked about just don't stick down as tightly to the underlying corneal stroma as your average person's. And that, that can happen, you know, some people just have an innate the kind of deficiency of the sticking proteins that cause those, those cells to stick down. And in some people it can happen if you get a scratch on the surface of the eye, but the scratch doesn't quite knock off all the cells as you heal, you can kind of heal with a, not a great attachment back down to the, to the underlying stroma as well. Um, uh, for all those conditions, they can cause both problems with vision, especially if they happen over the center of the vision, because remember your epithelium is really, really important to, to vision. Um, and they can also cause symptoms of something we call recurrent erosions. Recurrent erosions are, are typically painful um, scratches on the surface of the eye that happen when that loose patch of cells kind of rips off spontaneously. For most people that happens, um, you know, either overnight or in the morning, first thing when you wake up your eye, uh, wake up in the morning, and there's several different treatments for that. Um, uh, kind of going, you know, lubricating the eyes better, lubricating the eyes at nighttime, making sure your eyelids are healthy to kind of removing that patch of abnormal cells and the abnormal proteins underneath them and letting your only natural surface cells heal back in um, smoothly. Um, so that's a, that's a common thing that uh, uh, us cornea specialists see and treat. Great, thank you. Okay, we're at time. There's two questions left. So one is, uh, trans are transplant materials from cadavers? And I think Dr. Shell answered this in the talk. Um, you can speak to that for a second. Yes, yes. So uh, uh, transplants come from, their organ donations that come from people who passed away, who themselves or their relatives have decided to donate their organs. And then the last question uh, is, can you speak about pinguecula and can they be removed or reduced? 
So pinguecula are some sun damage changes of the conjunctiva and the conjunctiva is the lining of the outside of the eye over the sclera. And typically in the inside corners or the outside corners, we all get, it's very common to see sun damage, which is a little elevated plaque. It doesn't grow over the cornea. When it grows over the cornea, we call that a pterygium and that can affect your vision. But a pinguaculum are little tiny elevated plaques that can sometimes get red. So yes, they can be removed, but the real question is, is should they be removed? So as a surgeon, we always say the only way to avoid a surgeon surgical complication is to not have surgery. So technically they're quite easy to remove, but it involves cutting and sometimes stitches and some irritation. More commonly, the idea is what bothers you about the pinguecula and almost always the answer is that they're red. And what happens is that the, if your eyes are dry or they're uh, inflamed with allergies or you're rubbing a lot because they're elevated with the rubbing and the dryness, that's what's causing the redness. So rather than have a surgery, it typically makes a little more sense just to lubricate your eyes really well with the tears like we talked about or to figure out how to stop rubbing your eyes and to use some allergy drops to keep from rubbing. All right. Thank you very much. I think we're at time and I wanna respect everyone's time. A uh, big thank you to Dr. Shalhorn and Dr. Seitzman. This was really great, informative and thank you everybody for joining us tonight and hopefully we'll see you again next week.